estimate and, and figures, and including this one. Right? So, so hydraulic fracturing is typically associated with horizontal drilling now, right? Although hydraulic fracturing has been around for a long, long time. Uh, anybody know when the first hydraulic fracture was done, performed? Forty-seven, Halliburton did it in 1947, and it was, you know, considered a commercial. It was sort of researched there in 47 when they did it the first time. But by the early 50s, 50, 51, it was considered commercial. You know, people it was in widespread use, and something like, uh, you know, over a million hydraulic fracture treatments have been done in the United States alone since then. So um, it's been around a long, long time, and uh, Anyway, it's typically now associated with horizontal drilling because with horizontal drilling we can we can access or stimulate a lot more of the reservoir uh, with hydraulic fracturing. So when you uh, when you drill vertically, of course, your pay zone, say it's a small thin layer of shale, if you go in and you treat it with hydraulic fracture, stimulate it with hydraulic fracture, you're only going to re you know, access a very small portion. And it's quite an expensive endeavor. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you can get sort of the bang for the buck. Uh, so now, with horizontal drilling and, and uh, you know the the, the uh, uh, what's the word geo 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 steering. Thank you. I <laughs> went blank. Right. And so now with with horizontal drilling and geo steering, uh, they can keep the horizontal leg in you know tight pay zones for a long ways. You know uh, and and also can do it a lot quick, quicker. I mean, now, uh, if you look at some of the early sort of work that was done in shales in the Barnett, um, you know, the, the, the drilling times in those early wells, the horizontal wells, were like on the order of 55 days or something like that. And then you see these operators just, you know, after some experience, get it to 40 and 20. And, you know, now they, get, they can drill a, a well that's a mile deep and a mile long in eight days or something like that. So it's, it's pretty impressive in that, you know, the drilling, uh, it's still a very expensive part of the operations. Uh, there's just certainly room for improvement, but the drilling has, has you know, made this where this can be a, um, the br getting the drilling costs down have made this where this can be a profitable endeavor with slightly higher oil prices than they are now, right? So the idea is that you drill uh, out and if I were to drill this horizontal leg as the fractures are shown here, I guess I, I was going to ask you to answer a question, but it's on the on the chart, right? So you want to, <laughs> you know, typically you drill in the direction of minimum horizontal stress, and then they'll go to the end or the toe of the well, right? The heel and the toe, they go to the toe, and they, uh, usually this is done with what's called plug and perf, right? So they set a plug and perforate the well with shape charges, so if it's cased, right? So it's, uh, uh, they use the shape charges to basically poke hole in the steel casing. And then they pump fluid in at a, at a very high pressure. Uh, in shales, typically it's water, mostly water, slick water, right? It's like 98% water. There's all types of other fluids that have been pumped, uh, you know, Polymer cross sink gels, um, energetic fluids like uh, where you know compressed, say compressed natural gas, you could even you can even fracture with. Um, but in in shales, for the most part, they respond pretty well to slick water, and that that has to do with the low viscosity of water and the fact that in shales, uh, a lot of the mechanism is inducing slip on natural fractures. So it's not just creating these sort of long bi-wing planar fractures like are in this picture, but rather uh, injecting the water, and of course there's natural fractures in the rock, and getting the water onto those fractures so that you increase the pore pressure enough that they slip. And when they slip, then we can hear that or see it, and, and we, I'll show you some data from that later. Um, and the, the idea, we actually don't know for sure, we don't know everything, but the idea is that, you know, even a, even a natural fracture that's closed uh, in the rock will still be orders of magnitude more permeable than, uh, than the shell, than the matrix. 
So if we can induce a little bit of slip uh, and just create a little bit more permeability or connectivity to the main fracture, then you know we can get a lot more production out of these wells. So it's sort of thought that the mechanism in shale is that we're inducing a lot of slip on natural fractures that are in the rock, and that adds the conductivity back to the matrix, of course. Um, in a typical operation, uh, in addition to the water, there's a tremendous amount of sand or propant pumped in, and the idea is that the sand will make its way into the fractures and prop it open, hold the fractures open. Um, and there's pretty good correlation, again, in most shales between the amount of fluid you pump and the amount of sand you pump and the amount of production in the well. You know, it's not to say it always works perfectly, but there's pretty good correlation between you know, a high volume of water, high volume of sand, and the amount of and amount of production, right? So, you know, the question might be, there's always diminishing returns. You don't want to say, well, just, if I can get, it's not infinite, right? If I pump infinite water, infinite sand, I don't get infinite production. There's, there's always a point of diminishing return. And, and you say the expense of sand and water uh, play a big role in all this. Okay, so uh, y you'll notice that the way that uh, this is sort of cartoonishly drawn and that these interior fractures are kind of smaller than the exterior fractures. This actually occurs. It occurs due to uh, so-called stress shadowing effect. Now, the, the scale here is not quite right. I mean, if you were to see this sh stress shadowing effect, these would be on fractures that are spaced on the order of 10 to hundreds of feet apart, okay? Not, you know, if this is a mile long, the, and then, you know, at the scale, these would be like every few thousand feet. In that case, uh, you probably wouldn't see this stress shadowing, but you do see stress shadowing <coughs> uh, because the, you know the outer fractures are basically, you know, you've strained you've strained the rock or pushed the rock, and so now you have more compressive stress, right? depending on the order of which you do <coughs> in which you do the fracturing. So if you were propagating all of these simultaneously, you would see a growth that looked like this because the exterior. Uh, they sort of feel no resistance out here, so they can grow larger, but they compress the rock in the interior. If, again, they're close enough that they, that they disturb each other, right? <coughs> uh, then you'd see the interior fractures being compressed like this. And so, uh, you know, we have a lot of computer models. A lot of what my, my research is on is in uh, computer simulation of these fractures. But specifically, you know, with me, uh, these sort of long bi-wing planar fractures, we, we have a pretty good handle of what's going on in, in these types of events. <coughs> what, the research area now is primarily with respect to complex fracture networks and shales. So the activation of all these natural fractures and you know, much more complexity than what you see in something like this. So another just another cartoon to kind of demonstrate the, the process. This would be a vertical well, but the idea, at least on the surface, is the same. So once the well's drilled, then you come in, and they have uh, frack trucks and sand trucks, and you'll see all this equipment on the surface. And again, if you've worked there uh, on the frack job, then you know it's an enormous amount of equipment. Here's a picture of a frack job in the Barnett. So you know to give you some scale, these are trucks, right? So that's one, two, three, four, uh, you know, 18 wheeler size trucks there. There's another four, two, three, you know, so many, you know, so they're just right here. Uh, there's what, eight, nine, 10, 11. That's, that's 11, 18 wheelers, right? And then there's another approximately that amount over there. Um, and then a whole bunch of water tanks, right? Uh, so, this was uh, done in the Barnett. You know, a lot of the work being done now is, uh, especially in the Eagle Ford, they've transitioned to so-called pad drilling operations. So from basically what you'll see, uh, one uh, drilling operate, one drill head on the on the surface, you'll s there'll be many horizontal legs, typically in an array. So in the direction of minimum horizontal stress, uh, they'll come along. And in, in the Eagle Ford, this is particularly important because there's a large stress difference. There's a large stress difference in the Eagle Ford, so most of the wells are drilled in sort of an array uh, pattern, you know, parallel to one another. And then uh, there's quite a bit of so-called, uh, you know, creativity 
in how they do the fracture operations in, in um, so-called zipper fracks. You ever heard of a zipper frack or seen a zipper frack, guys? So a zipper frack is when you have two parallel well bores, and instead of just fracture, 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 you would fracture, fracture on the other well, fracture here, fracture on the other well, fracture, fracture on the other well. And that's done, again, to, um, to relieve some of the stress shadowing effect. Because the stress shadowing can, uh, in this case, it's not drawn that way, but it can be uh, so severe that it causes the fractures to turn. And particularly, if you were to just go to the toe and move up and fracture, move up and fracture, if you are not careful of uh, you know, staying out of these stress shadow zones, what you can see is the fractures will actually turn into towards the other fractures to the extent that by the time you get to the heel, you, you can have fractures that are running nearly right along the well, well bore, and that's not what you want. It sort of defeats the purpose of stim you know, drilling horizontally so you can stimulate a large area. So uh, in the Barnett, however, the principal stress difference is quite small. And in those areas, these are, I think we talked about it, due to depletion and other things, these are sort of candidate areas for refracturing. So refracturing would be an area where you've already done a fracture job and you produce it for a while. And then you go back and you refracture it in such a way to promote more production. And I think this is, you know, actually in, in sort of the price scenario we're in right now, this is the real opportunity is identifying candidate wells for refracturing. Because when, as we talked about, when you have depletion, depletion can lead to stress reorientation. And so if you fractured it and your fractures originally went, uh, you know, in the direction perpendicular to minimum horizontal stress, now you've depleted the well and your stress is reoriented, you can go and fracture it again and, they, and your fractures will access new parts of the reservoir and you can increase the production. And of course, uh, this is a really great thing because then you, know, you eliminate all the drilling costs associated, well, most of the costs associated with uh, you know, bringing the well, having the well there, and then, then all you see is, is completion costs. 